Antarctica is big. It's almost one and a half times the size of the U.S. But honestly, that statistic really doesn't mean a whole lot until you're there, standing on the ice in your parka and looking wide-eyed at a big steaming volcano called Mount Erebus that's 70 miles away across a frozen sea. That's when it sinks in. You're on the edge of the biggest, coldest, emptiest place on Earth. I went there in December 2007 with three geologists, Hui assistant scientist Adam Sewell, grad student Andrea Burke, and senior scientist Mark Kurz. We went to an extinct volcano called Mount Morning on the Antarctic mainland, about 800 miles from the South Pole. Also with us was Chris Linder, our indomitable photographer, who took all of these great photos, including me covered in sunscreen and Antarctic dirt. It feels strange to be left by helicopter on a patch of lava in the middle of Antarctica. Up until then, you've been totally taken care of by the support crew at McMurdo Station, some 500 people who can teach you how to change the spark plugs on a snowmobile and remind you to bring a backup satellite phone. And then suddenly, it's just the five of us. The sun never goes down, and by the time we had camp set up, it was about 10 at night. You can tell here because our shadows point almost due north, or to the left in this photo. They just rotate around us counterclockwise all day, all week, all month. We're just like little sundials out there. It's phenomenal to find yourself on these broad, empty plains of broken lava. We were in the middle of a layer cake of three different lava flows, one 300,000 years old, another 150,000 years old, and then on top this red one, which was 25,000 years old. It's just been sitting here ever since it erupted, with the wind gnawing away at it. There's no plants to burrow roots into it, no running water to make canyons, and no soil to cover it up. That's why geologists love it here. Everything they're interested in is right out in front of them. The wind was a nearly constant presence. People always ask how cold it was in Antarctica, but the truth is it was pretty warm, even above freezing sometimes. What you can't see in these sunny photos is the wind pouring down out of the south and carrying chilled air straight from the high polar plateau. That's what made it cold. Here we're huddled out of the wind on a day when it was blowing about 50 miles an hour. We're pressed up against these black basalt pillars and eating chocolate bars. It basically never stops. You can see the wind in the grooves it's carved in the rock itself. All these channels that Andrea's walking on were chewed out of solid lava by specks of dust driven by gales. It takes millennia upon millennia for sand to scrape away rock. On this lava flow, what you're looking at is about 150,000 years of constant work. I was fascinated by the way the wind had decorated the flows with rocks, tucking pebbles of every available color into each nook and crevice, and carefully matching them for size. I learned that modern field geology still involves a lot of pounding at rocks with hammers. Mark, Adam, and Andrea would bash off chunks and hold them up close, like a chipmunk with a nut, and peer at it with a magnifying lens to identify the crystals in it. They were mainly looking for deep green shards of olivine, a mineral Mark can use to measure how long a rock has been exposed to the elements. This is Adam's high-tech addition to the toolkit. It's a big yellow cube called a LiDAR, and it takes very accurate 3D pictures of the landscape. It was Adam and Andrea's job to haul this 80-pound box, worth $100,000, over the ankle-breaking gravel and up to the top of the tallest boulder on the lava plain. Once they had the LiDAR set up, it had an unobstructed view that, even aside from all the data it was collecting, was pretty spectacular. That was the day the wind had started to build. It was already pretty cold out in the open, and the gusts worsened over the next week until walking required leaning forward with all of our weight. It felt kind of like barging through an invisible crowd of Christmas shoppers, and in the end it spelled trouble for our kitchen tent. We loved that giant Antarctic oven because it had space. It had headroom and places to sprawl out, a makeshift table where we could cook and plan and type and drink hot tea. And with two stoves melting snow most of the time, it got toasty warm. But Mark, a four-time Antarctic veteran, was constantly worried about how the big blocky tent could hold up in a real windstorm. And he was right. At the height of the storm, the wind snapped a two-inch tent pole clean in two, and the geologists had to retreat to their triangular Scott tents. That was just two days after Chris and I had left, catching a helicopter ride during a lucky lull. 
The three geologists had another month of fieldwork in front of them. Fortunately, their remaining tents held strong, and eventually the windstorm passed them by, leaving them alone in the landscape, still big, still bright, still empty.